Got a new hat today. What's up, Instagram? It is Thursday, April 23rd. I know everyone is just right on top of that calendar, right on top of the routine and the day of the week and the commute and the grind of keeping up with soccer practice and baseball practice and dance practice and play practice and dinner reservations and buying tickets for sporting events and concerts and all that stuff. I'm just kidding. Um, you know what? I am making jokes about what we can't do right now, what we used to do all the time, but hey man, what are you gonna do? Cry about it? Or are you gonna do something about it? It's a great time to like chill out, great time to think, great time to just relax and let your mind settle and figure out what it is that you really wanna be doing. So, um, you know, the beautiful thing about when you've kind of listen to your gut and you start making it making it happen um, you uh, you just kind of make it happen and the world will open up for you it's not easy but you gotta just go for it and you gotta you gotta live your life you know you can't just sit around and you can't do something that you feel like you should be doing when it doesn't feel right so there's my preaching for the day um, I've had a great week. We're going with the four-day weeks now. Today's the end of the week. So on Monday, I had John Viner. Tuesday, I had um, uh, Eric Stanley. And then uh, last night, I had... Um, who did I have last night? I had short-term memory loss last night. Uh, I'm just kidding. My buddy Al Thompson was on. And tonight, I got a great guest Somebody I've known for, I think, 16 years since Family Guy came back in 2004 from cancellation. Uh, he currently runs Family Guy, uh, along with Rich Appel. Uh, it's Alex Sulkin tonight, and i uh, got a piece of fuzz in my mouth, but I don't anymore. So um, Alec the Sulk Sulkin will be joining me here in a second, and um, he he's... Uh, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to let him on in and we'll talk about all the great things he does. And he wrote the Ted movies and A Million Ways to Die. Oh, there he is. What's oh, up? Can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. I can. It's perfect. You, you're wearing uh, your Tom Brady sweatshirt. Uh, yeah. How many Tom Brady items do you own, roughly? Roughly. In this room or in life? I, I have uh, many. I have probably 10. 10? All ten. right. You know he's one of the greats. I'm just kidding. I like to say that. I know you. I know he's the goat. I get it. One of the greats. You know, now that he's gone to Tampa Bay, do you think he'll go in the Hall of Fame with his Tampa Bay team, like Wade Boggs did? <laughs> I don't, I can't even think about it, Mike. But knowing Tom, you know, he might uh, he might find a way to put a cherry on top of this whole thing and bring another one home for the good cherry. But... Yeah, yeah, he might. Um, you know, Wade Boggs went into the Hall of Fame as a, a Tampa Bay Ray. Well, I mean, as a Red Sox fan, it's sort of preferable to him going in as a Yankee. Well, of course. But yeah. it, it seems like ridiculous. He was kind of a ridiculous person. from what I Yeah, think. I think so. Yeah. A lot of contradiction in his life. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate you jumping on here with me. Um, Happy to. Love you. Yeah. You're a great guy. Love you. I'll come, I'll come when I'm called. Uh, sweet. Uh, no jokes there. Yeah, we, uh, we will punctuate a lot of punchlines with whistles. Uh, John Viner and I touched on that on this feed the other night. And, um, you know, it's just something to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, but, it's, uh, it's a, in lieu of writing a punchline. You can, yeah. Yeah. Remember Charlie Callis. You're, you, you're old enough to remember Charlie. He would just wake, make weird noises and work very hard That's the for sound, laughs. The sound of young people running away. Yeah, that doesn't matter. We're here, you know what? We're here for all people, Alec. And yeah. um, I mean, if Tom Devani's watching, we're here for him. That's right. Does he Does he know how to work Instagram? I think he has Kel do it. Oh yeah, Kel, that's right. I bet they are watching. Kelly, if you and Tom are watching, please say hello. We love so you. yeah, it's fun. You can you can see people waving there at the bottom, et cetera. And um, we, hey, shout out to whoever you want. You know, is that, there we go, there's Kelly. <laughs> Kelly and Tom. They're there. Hi, guys. I met Tom around the time I met you when Family Guy came back from cancellation. And, um, you know, what I've been doing, you know, since since this whole thing started, I've started farting around on Instagram and 
did some stuff with wigs, did some wig play, <laughs> some character, that. some yeah, some character work, some uh, face swap stuff, and um, you know, I started thinking, you know what? Let me just see what. Let me let me connect with some people. Let's let's talk to some some folks about what they do. And I think you're you're in the minority of people who get to really kind of do what they want for a living. I mean, you get to make jokes and and meet Tom Brady and celebrities and and um, you know, it's a fun it's a fun thing, you know. And um, you know, I, I took the chance and uh, you know I'm doing it. And I'm curious as to when you like realized you were funny and when you decided to kind of do what you do, like as a kid? Oh, well, I mean, I think growing up in a Jewish household, is <laughs> the, <laughs> the yeah. <laughs> Judaism's already funny. They, you're sort of encouraged to be like a smart ass in a way. And I just feel like I was always that. And, uh, I was also, I made a very wise choice at a young age, which is I decided to befriend the school bully. And so I was sort of protected by a shield and I could just snipe. Right. Say funny things with impunity because I had Max Perlman by my side. Max Perlman, another Jewish fellow. Oh, yeah. But he was like six feet at 12 years old. So so, so he thought you were funny, obviously. We did. So. We were in the same carpool together. So okay. The carpool into work every day and I worked on him in the car until finally... You know, we were right. two of them. That's smart. You had a built-in bodyguard. You could get away with whatever. Very Machiavellian. Really so, so, did, so you made fun of the other kids, and you're, I'm assuming your teachers and, you know, whoever happened to be around? Teachers, not so much. We were scared. You didn't make fun of the teachers there. It was like a coat and tie school, and it was very, like, turn of the century, last century. Was it boarding school? Uh, it was I guess not. You... It was for some. Okay. Not for, I didn't board. But so you were a day a day schooler at the boarding school. A student. Got it. Got it. And where was that? Where did you grow up? What town? That well, that was in a town called Newton, Massachusetts. Yeah. And I grew up with one town over called Weston, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. A hotel and a cookie. Um, <laughs> that's very good. I don't know. Big okay. Newton came from Newton. That's where it's from. Is that true? Yep. I. You know what? I don't mind a fig Newton at all. They're very good. They are like a sleeve of them, and it also feels like ten percent healthier than a lot of right. Them. It was fig, you know, and a Newton. So, so you were. Um, that was, it was kind of like me. I was sort of a you know, the wise ass, and um, you know, just I loved imitating people. I loved, and and Viner and I talked about this as as I grew up a little bit older. I loved imitating Steve Martin and Chevy Chase, and I would just basically bring their acts to school. And therefore, you know, I, I never claimed they were mine, but I, I knew them verbatim. I did the same thing, but it was just like, for me, it was like Billy Crystal, you know, because oh. I love that 84 season of SNL. Right. Um, where they had that all-star cast with like Martin Short and Billy Crystal and Harry Shearer and all those guys. And right. So I used to, that was the first time I was watching SNL and I would come into school, like you said, and just have like all the Fernando's hideaway and all that shit. Okay. And it was, you know, at the time seemed funny. I didn't, I didn't know I, I didn't know then that I wouldn't stand Billy Crystal later. Yeah. 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 I get it. I get it. Somebody, somebody saying that audio is acting up. Can, can anyone concur with that or tell me it's fine? Uh, just as we're rolling here. But, um, so, so did you ever like host a talent night or were you ever in like, a school play or I, I think Viner said, you, and you knew John Viner in school. Yeah. So yes, I was in school plays a lot. I really liked that. Got, you know, very into it. Um, starting back in elementary school. Um, but then yes, with John Viner, uh, we went to high school together. We were in uh, Greece together. Nice. Um, and I think that another one he may have touched on it, he was suspended for, and we were, so he wasn't in it, like he got suspended. But. Oh, what did he get suspended for? I think he was along for the ride when somebody sort of joyrided one of the maintenance vans or something. <laughs> That's good. That's so, good, you know? That sounds harmless enough, just out driving oh, a, fun. a stolen vehicle. Yeah. I'm sure he had a fun four months at home with his parents. Damn, is that what it was? I, I, I forget. 
But they, they, they seem like they were understanding and in tune with him. He talks about that a lot. He tells it. The way he tells it, they're wonderful people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so did your parents, um, they support your, your comedy? Did they think you were funny? Well, of course my mom thinks that, you know, uh, like she, I can do no wrong in my mind. Right. And my dad is a little harsher of a critic, but he's right you know when he says something's funny like it it usually is like genuinely funny it has to be legitimately funny for him on some gut level for him right. to say hey i like that but yeah they both encouraged it and after college uh when i i moved to uh, new york city for a little while and um i was trying to do stand-up comedy there i mean i was doing it not really well uh and they said well for, for three years while you're there, uh, we'll, we'll help you. And if you don't make it after three years, then we think of plan B. So right. thankfully, uh, you know, I was able was... to get a job out in LA. Uh, and I was living rent free with like a girlfriend at the time. So it's not like they were doing that much, <laughs> but right. it right. was, you know, expenses. Right. Gotcha. So I'm talking to Alex Sulkin, a showrunner, family guy, writer of many funny movies and TV shows. And, um, my uh, my son Jack may be on here, but his buddy and, and his buddy Eric McDaniel and Eric's sister Alyssa, who you met last year at Comic Con, are big fans of yours and are waving hello. So, oh, he he hello McDaniel's and hello Jack, if you're watching, if you're off your video games. Um, so, so I'm, I'm I'm seeing a lot of good questions here, and we'll I think we'll answer them just through this conversation. So, where did you go to college, and what did you study, and did you do anything to pursue your comedy while you were in college? Huh. Well, the, the, the last question, the, the answer is no. Um, but I went to Connecticut College, mm -hmm. uh, the Camels. Con right? call. Oh, Con Camels. Camels. All right. Uh, yeah. They, uh, they go toe to toe with anyone. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, it was a good experience, uh, but I got mostly just got stoned with my friends. Right. One of them was our friend Wellesley, uh, who we wrote yep. with for years and years. So I met him there at college. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I didn't do, I didn't take classes that really were like, oh, writing or writing for television or, you know, whatever. I was just an English major and I got stoned a lot and yeah. just tried to scrape by at the end of the semester like we a lot of us did. Yeah. Uh, but then my senior year, I was lucky enough to, through a family connection, because I'm Jewish, to uh, get an internship at Saturday Night Live. Yes. So that was the moment that kind of helped. Yes. Yeah, so I was there for a couple of years after that. Okay. Well, we'll keep going with that. I see Goldie. Uh, Goldie's waving at us. And um, what is what is it, Goldie? He's just, he just he said, and it shows, and I'm not sure what he's referring oh, to. Jewish. Oh, Jewish. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you see, I know. I see no. I see no creed or faith or color. What about now. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, I, I find it interesting that you knew Viner in high school, John Viner, who is now one of our our peers and our, our comedy buddies, and has a great career. And also Wellesley, who um, you know you wrote with for years. You were originally partnered with when you came on to Family Guy, Correct. and you guys wrote the Ted movies with Seth. And I think A Million Ways to Die, the three of you wrote as well. That's right. Yeah, no, it, it's been awesome to, and this is, I feel like you, <clears throat> the sort of the theme of your shows these last couple of weeks, it's like the people you meet along the way, you know, if somebody's making you laugh really hard at a certain point in your life, and, you know, there are always ways to reconnect with those people, especially if you're in, in comedy, you know, like yeah. that, but that's what we remember is like, oh my God, this guy made me laugh all the time. Right. If you ever want to come out to Los Angeles and be right, you know, then then it's sort of everybody can kind of come come as they as they please and reconnect. And, you know, Wellesley helped me get my first job out in L.A. on the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. And yeah, both of us were would talk up John Viner to whoever would listen. And then he would come along and Goldie was another guy we, uh, you know, Viner and I did stand up with in New York, our friend John Goldblatt. Yeah. Uh, and he's hilarious. So, like, of course, he saw us doing it. And he's like, well, I'm funnier than them. And he came out. Right. Right. Now doing mar marginally. 
Okay, so coming out of college, you had a family friend, uh, your, your Jewish family friend of, of, of connections, uh, got you a job at um, an internship at SNL. Yeah. Now, what year was that? Who were the big cast members at that okay, point? Okay, so yeah, it's interesting. It was, uh, that was 94, 95. And so the cast was like, it was like the tail end of like Mike Myers, Chris Farley, uh, those people were still, I think Sandler was still there. Anyone I would have heard of? <laughs> nice. Very um, so it was the tail end of that. And so were you nervous as shit walking in there? Like you moved to the city and like, what? I was totally nervous, but I've never, it's, it was the, by far the most exciting job I've ever had. You know, right. it happened to be the first one. But like, just the excitement in that hallway goldie again was there he was a page right in front of the you know when they show the pages and they come out and do a sketch in the hallway like he was right one of those guys. <clears throat> and, that's uh, on his resume i think that it was in yeah, that right right um but that was that job was so exciting that place was so fun intoxicating all i ever wanted to do was stay there and be a writer there yeah uh, but then that went horribly wrong what what happened uh i can't believe i I, I tell this story a lot on podcasts and then I, I actually run into the people that I talk about and feel kind of bad, but it's, it's what happened. Okay. So I was uh, an intern uh, one year at SNL and then became a writer's assistant after college at SNL. And right. I, and that's a big bump because you're in the room. It was awesome. It was my dream just to get that job. And somehow I was able to get it. Describe that job real quick. What's that? Describe what, what, what was your job? as a writer's assistant, what did you okay, That's what I was going to get into. It's not like the writer's assistants that you and I know where they have to be great typists and get everything down in the room. Cause okay. this is still like the edge of everybody using computers. It was like, nobody was really doing that. So it's kind of like sit here with a notepad and organize our meals. It was basically all it was. Fun. And so I just got to sit there and I would watch them, you know, pitch or work on stuff. Or, and then they would go off into their offices and I'd kind of play like primitive games on my computer uh and get stoned in the hallway right and then, um so i wasn't great at it but it wasn't a hard job right and nobody got fired from snl nobody did because the, there was a music guy named hal wilner who like burned his office down with a crack pipe oh a tripod okay I'm, I'm messing with this thing i have like you're basically covered up on my screen i'm trying to get it. i don't know how to do this so all right just keep 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 uh oh there we go Face. all right you're back thank you sorry no so there was a music guy that burned his office down with a crack pipe did he get fired no okay yeah, the, the point is hard to get fired from yes SNL. and somehow in the middle of the summer after my first season as a writer's assistant fully gung-ho to like come back i can't wait i'm gonna try and get more jokes on whatever i get a call you've been fired and i was like shocked but then my internal mind was also like i kind of sucked but everybody kind of sucked there. So, like, why was I picked out? It turns out that uh, Regis Philbin's daughter, J.J. Philbin, who okay. I've, I've met her several times, she's very nice. Uh, she went on her dad's show, her very popular morning show, Regis and Kathy Lee, and made a plea to the camera saying, Lauren Michaels, I'm graduating from college. Please hire me. So that was the story. I was, like, let go in an instant. Of course. So she was more <laughs> Jewish than you. Well, no, actually, way less. I've I'm just kidding. Before. I don't know what that means. I, I'm fine with the Jews. This is a common writer's room <laughs> thing for anyone else. I don't have to explain. I don't well, think no, I'm explaining to people who are watching. Yeah, but don't they know you? I, I don't guess, know. I guess they you got to be fucking careful these days. Oh, don't curse. Um, right. So anyway, I was let go from that. And, but then that created a thing where I ended up coming out to L.A., so... I, and so, if I stayed at SNL for a long time as a writer, I think I, I would, wouldn't have been as happy. Now, you mentioned, um, I'm talking to Alex Sulkin, uh, comedy uh, genius, uh, running Family Guy, written a bunch of movies, et cetera. And so, um, so you mentioned that your parents gave you three years in New York. They said you can go. And so that was the first of those years, your SNL year, or after that, they said you can hang out for three years, but then you got to get a real job if you don't have success in comedy. After. Okay. After. So like the SNL thing, because I was actually getting paid, not much, but like I was, that was a job. And then it was like, oh, I don't have a job and I'm too lazy to go like work at Barnes and Noble, like everyone could. Right. And 
like to sit around and watch TV and get stoned and then go out for two and a half hours and and to a couple of stand up clubs to wait in line for an open mic with people yep. like yeah. Uh, uh, he says if you'd stayed at SNL, you would have been fine. All right. Uh, okay. I, I could see that. But That's you know, right. I used to just do it for like two hours a day. And uh, that's really all you're doing all day. You don't make a cent doing it. So you're living like this weird secret where it's like, oh, God, well, thank God the parents are chipping in a little bit and I'm living free. You know, right. Free. So those were very lucky circumstances that not everybody has. And what years were those? I'm sorry. Was it like 96? Yeah, that's 96 to 98. Okay. I was there... I'm, I was there during that time. I actually moved. Um, I had spent a little time in it. I, I, oh, geez, I see that some of my uh, in-laws are watching now. Oh, no. Nice. I'm, All right. He's a very I'm... fine young man. Um, so, yeah, I had, I had lived in L.A. for a little bit doing ground links and stand-up. I moved back to Virginia. I shot some Golden killing us, by the way. things that I wanted to do. The TV is talking to me. I get why Trump finds this intoxicating. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I was in New York at that time. I'd moved up there. I wanted to be on SNL and I was, I did a little bit of stand up here and there. I was auditioning for commercials all the time. And then, um, so I was probably, I probably saw you perform back in the day. Did you ever do like the Luna Lounge or Collective Unconscious? It seemed like those were people who were pretty well on the, their way. A couple of times, but not really like. There was a, a stand-up crowd in New York at that time who were like a little cooler and more indie than I was, somehow plugged into like a downtown scene that I never yeah. had access to. Yeah. And I never really had access to the uptown scene either. I was sort of in a weird swamp. You were a midtown guy. Um, which was not a good thing. Um, but I performed mostly at this place, again, with Goldie, one of the worst dumps ever called Hamburger Harry's. Gladys's Comedy Club in the back of Hamburger Harry's. Oh, street. was that where? What street was it on? Forty fifth. I think yeah. I, I I went there some. Yeah, it's right off Times Square. Yep. And we used to have to hand out flyers on the street corner, you know, and and we would and I did that with Viner too for Gladys's and we was would, that Galifianakis there at that time? I think I feel like a Gaffigan. Okay. All right. Gaffigan was always there inexplicably it was before he was huge but he was already great way better than we were right they have to hand out these flyers and so viner and i would always do this little con job because people would walk by so fast and viner would always be like steve martinson is here tonight you know like jerry <laughs> sign and this will be here. <laughs> always doing that. that's so, hilarious yeah we ended up attracting a lot of like german tourists from times square who were very confused halfway through the show good Good. Um, so what was your mindset? Like, okay, so obviously you're a satirist, largely. Like, did you just, I know I used to just sit back and think about it. all this stuff is stuff is stupid. Like these commercials on TV, yeah. I hate because they're clearly trying to sell me something. And they're just so obvious, you know, like I like to make fun of that. And I, you know, I was kind of angry. And so I would, I didn't like, you know, systems. I don't like big, you know, I don't like corporate structures. And, you know, I, I couldn't imagine, I did that for like a year. I couldn't imagine doing anything like that. So I just made fun of everything and tried to figure out what, how to say it and be recognized for it. Okay. So when you say corporate structure for a year, you were, you had a corporate job. I was in an advertising agency because I thought that would be kind of creative, but it That's was just, I, I would do if I, if I, didn't wasn't able to do this i always thought i could work in it in an ad agency i don't know yeah yeah but i i hated it and so but but your mindset was obviously you I, I would like to be high all day and and relax and now i'm going to go be funny like what was it did you feel like you had something to say or did you just feel like you wanted to get out and fart around and, and do something fun yeah i didn't i had no as a stand-up I had no character. I had no uh, energy. I had no real point of view. And Gold, right. well, I'm sure, back me up on all this. No right. point of view. Um, but I thought that I could write some good jokes. Like they would not be connected in any satisfying way for an audience. But I right. felt like here and there, 
there would be glimmers of like, okay, that's a good joke. And no one can tell me that that's not a good joke. Right. Like I, I knew that I could do some of that. Right. So then back in that era, as you remember, like if you wanted to get a joke on SNL weekend update, there was weirdly a way you could do that. You could fax. fax in yeah. the joke, and that was like kind of a known thing amongst comics. Right. So writing that style of joke that's like not connected to anything was actually like you're trying to help. It's an aid of something. It wasn't just pointless. Sure. And, and when the Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn was getting put together, I knew that those kinds of jokes that were like not necessarily connected, but kind of funny could possibly be valuable on a show like that. Right. And so how did you meet Craig Kilborn? Did you meet him in the process of interviewing for that? No, you know, um, I didn't meet him until I already had the job because I had submitted jokes that again, Wellesley, who was out here previous said, look at my friend Alex jokes and Craig liked them. And mm -hmm. so then you had to go meet someone at CB who worked for uh, Worldwide Pants, Letterman's company in, in New York. And they just basically had to meet you and make sure you weren't crazy was their right. job. <laughs> named Jude you were Brennan. dangerous, yeah. It's a woman named Jude Brennan who was actually very nice. Um, and so you have a 15 minute meeting with her and it's like she knows that you know that you're just, you just don't have, you can't be crazy for the next 15 minutes, so. Right. That all worked out. Cool. And so, um, so Kilborn was based in New York? No, but I okay. was in New York and I had to meet this woman because she okay. was in New York and then come and then, you, and then you relocated to LA for the Kilborn show. Mm -hmm. And what year was that? That was 1999. 1999. So, and that was actually the year after Family Guy started. So, um, yeah. all right. So you were a funny kid with a big bully to back you up. And then you had support of general support of your parents. Your dad was a tougher critic than your mom. Then you went to critic. firm, but fair, firm, but fair. And um, then you went to Connecticut College, where you didn't really do anything to apply your comedy other than smoke weed and, and observe things and think of funny things to say about things. That's right. <laughs> and then you got a job at SNL out of the blue. And then that didn't last long. And so that, that was that kind of your dream job. I mean, you just want to be on SNL. I think you, you touched oh, on that. Totally. And um, I'm sure as you did, as we all did, I'm sure you wanted to be on as a performer. It's like the goal. The yeah. Mountain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I loved every minute of being there. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I got some good exposure there. Um, you, you probably recall some of the old short films that my brother and I made. Uh -huh. um, my brother Patrick was Seth's roommate at RISD. And I was spending my time for a few years shooting shorts that I was in that were commercial parodies because I wanted to make fun of advertising. And that was sort of my thing. And so I was in them and I wrote them and then my brother and my friend Bunt shot them and they actually got in the hands of of the of the UCB people actually and we shot this short called Little Donnie with them and then that got in the hands of Aaron Frazier who used to be Aaron Maroney who worked at SNL and then she liked it showed Lauren the stuff he liked it and so they called us in to shoot these shorts for their Burley Bear College cable network, uh, <laughs> which Ted Jessup, our friend, which we can talk more about in a minute, um, was in charge of at that point. So I had exposure there. They actually invited me. I, I was at the table read for Superstar, that movie with Molly Shannon. And I, I read some parts at the table and was on, on that floor and saw, you know, saw the place behind the scenes and knew, you know, Lauren said hi to me, remembered me, you know, like I was getting pretty close. And then Seth called with the Family Guy opportunity because I'd been on the phone with him many times over the previous two years talking about jokes for his presentation. And, you know, that's another point that I like to make is like, help, help other people do their thing. You know, I had my thing, I wanted to do this and I'll call Seth and I'd say, hey, what do you think about this joke for this short or whatever? And he'd weigh in and then he'd say, hey, I need a, a joke for this spot in my thing. And I'd give him a joke, you know, just, yeah, I think, to anyone who's listening to this that's just trying to make it or trying to figure their way creatively, just do your thing. Don't be afraid to call favors and don't 
hesitate to help people that you like do their stuff because you know that led to family guy which you know we've been rolling on that for 22 years with a, a little bit of a hiatus there near the beginning but um so so i get it so so I, I moved to la around the same time and so you moved to la who'd you know in la did you know some of your folks some 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 comedy people at all anybody i knew wellesley i don't think i really knew anybody else when i came out here i don't think so I, and, and it's funny i lived for the first couple of weeks in like a really crappy motel right across from CBS Television City on Beverly Boulevard. Okay. Um, yeah. Right next to that mobile station there, there's this like tiny little motel. And yeah. I, remember, I used to live there and I would walk out because I didn't have a car yet to like a place that was a couple blocks away to get a pizza, bring it home, sit on the motel bed and watch. Uh, it was that Lakers team of Kobe and Shaq like making their run. Yeah. Run very excited and yeah sit on like a made motel bed you know at night for like an hour and a half and then be like all right i guess i'm going to sleep right so there was nothing going on and then i moved literally across the street into the apartments above air one for those of uh, you uh -huh. know, la and uh i used to just walk right next door to work and i've actually maintained that a lot when i've been out in la i've been able to walk to work for like 15 of the 20 years that i've worked yeah, because you used to live right near Family Guy. Um, Still do. Um, yeah. Can you walk from where you live? I do all the time. I didn't know that. Okay, because I knew you were in an apartment building nearby uh, at one point. So, um, walk to work, kids. Yeah, walk to work. Why not? I love walking. Me too. Um, all right, cool. I'm hanging with Alex Selkin. We're drinking, I'm drinking tea. You're drinking some water there, Alex? Yeah. End of the Fresh water. It's good for you. Sure. And um, yeah, Alec and I've worked together for about 16 years on, on the FG. And yeah. so Family Guy, we started in the valley on Laurel Canyon Boulevard across yeah. from a Gelson supermarket. And we lasted about two and a half years. And then it got canceled. And then the fans spoke and great ratings late night on reruns and the DVDs flew off the shelf. So they brought us back. And that's when I met you. I met you probably right before that because you, how did you, you were working on Killborn, and then how did you meet Seth? Because I, I, I felt like I was back and forth to Virginia some uh, for family stuff. And then I would go back and then all of a sudden you guys were hanging out at the Brass Monkey. It was you and Viner and Wellesley had befriended Seth. Right. And so how did you guys meet? Well, we worked together in that in that brief moment where Family Guy was canceled. Yeah, the cavalcade Seth, of comedy. Yeah. Seth, well, Seth was still on an overall deal with Fox, so he had to work on a Fox show. They put him on this show that happened to be the, the first ever sitcom that Wellesley and I worked for. It was when we moved from Kilbourne to sitcoms. We worked on this show called The Pits. Okay. And, um, run by uh, Mike Scully, who we all love. Right, and, uh, and just a, a great writing staff that show had, and and Seth was one of them, and so we were Seth Wellesley and I were the same age, and we were like, hey, you know, making jokes with each other, and then we ended up going, as you said, to the Brass Monkey and singing karaoke, and then that's turned into a career. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's funny when you develop a comedy shorthand, you know, I. I, I I've talked about this some recently with some folks on here. You know, it's, it's again, not to sound too precious, but it's like music. It's like jamming. You're like, just you, just with a look, you get a joke and, you know, you find a groove and a rhythm for, you know, hopefully what you're working on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of little side grooves going on where you're just laughing at stuff that is extremely counterproductive, but it's still really fun to laugh with your buddies. Um, so, so you got that, you had that shorthand pretty quickly with Seth, it sounds like. Oh, we made sweet jazz together. Mm. Yeah, mm. no, he, he was just like, he, he is still, I mean, he's just undeniably hilarious, especially yeah. with the work environment and you're all focused on, hey, what can we do here that's funny? Like, yeah, 90% of what that guy says is hilarious. Yeah. Um, so I respected him right away. And honestly, I did, I, really knew nothing about Family Guy when I met him. I knew it existed and it kind of annoyed me 
just right. for the fun. Like I didn't watch it. I just thought, <laughs> I like the Simpsons. I don't want to deal with that. Right. And, but then when I met Seth, uh, I was like, this guy's hilarious. Maybe I should ch check out the show. Right. Uh, was a little disappointed. Well, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. it was. It's obviously it's very funny. So. Yeah. That's how it started. Hey, how many episodes? Have we made? Is it three fifty? Are we closing in on four hundred? Do you know? I think we're working on ones right now that are getting up there close to four hundred. We might we might be in the three eighties somewhere. In nice. Yeah. 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 That's that's good because I think we made fifty at the beginning before we were canceled. You know, we we're canceled for sort of politics and yeah. whatever. And you know, when we came back. My God, that was the best. That we came back to an order of thirty-five episodes, which is relatively unheard of. Um, that's basically a season and a more than a half. And you know, it, we did a we did Family Guy live up in Montreal, and that was the first time we were exposed to fans. Um, you know, people who dug the show, and it was just like, holy crap, man, we are onto something. We thought so, and thank God. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, that was great back then. And so then, when we started writing together, when we were, when we were all in the room, um, to me that was almost like the heyday. You know, you you doing the Blue Harvest episode, uh, you wrote that, and then with you all know, you guys because that was well, great. everybody gang bangs all the episodes, but you you clearly carried that one and and had a million great jokes in there. But that was just so much fun with that that new energy that we were like a real thing. We had a lot of the original writers and then you and, and Alec and Wells and you and uh, Viner and Wellesley and uh, other people came in, Tom Devaney and, uh, you know, just, and Alex Borstein was in the writer's room and Seth was in the writer's room. And it was just, yeah, it was, just, it was popping, man. I just remember just laughing so freaking hard, you know, every night except for the night that kelly made the brownies and uh we didn't know we were staying for dinner <laughs> there's no way they're still on yeah no i know do you want to tell that story um oh i don't you know i don't care there, there we, we ate some spiked brownies we didn't realize how spiked they were alec immediately said that he didn't feel good so he went home i think tom had one tom didn't even go back to the writer's room he called from his office and said he wasn't feeling well and so I was the only one in the room. This was at night and we were rewriting a script and I was so out of my mind. And I couldn't remember. I was so scared David Goodman was going to catch me and be mad at me. And he was like the showrunner. And I'm th sitting there thinking, Kelly's, yeah, thank you, Kelly, for making those brownies. Um, I remember Kelly called like Tom, hello? Oh, 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 shit. You know, Kelly's that was the best part of that whole experience was that we were, Tom brought them in or, you know, and said, we got to take these today. I think it was it the Friday before Thanksgiving. It was like some, it, it was sort of a celebration like, day. Yeah. I think these at lunch today. And we're like, all right. And he's like, Kel took one. She said, it's very mild. And we're like, yeah. oh, great. Then we all, all right. they, they all eat it at lunch. Like the minute we're done, like licking it off. Our <laughs> Kel calls like, they got so hard. Don't take them. Yeah. Yeah. Kel says, and they were delicious. Well, yeah, of course. It's a brand. They were delicious and uh, no, mentally brownie. nutritious. Yeah, but it's a little hard to mess up that brownie. But I will say, I was sitting in the writer's room, and at the time, we had couches that were all facing each other. So there was nowhere to hide, you know, and I wasn't wearing a hat or anything. And I was just, you know, plainly like buzzed. And I remember thinking to myself, do I usually look at people when I talk, or how do I, you know, I was just trying so hard to be cool. And I, was so lost for about an hour and then all of a sudden everything clicked in and I was on fire like just for about an hour like this boom oh my oh, boom 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 and, um, and, um, and we're highs and lows mostly highs um, anyway so that was fun that was the only time I ever yeah that worked but um so yeah talking to Alex Sulkin so then you're running Family Guy now. So so your trajectory was you came on as like a mid-level writer, I guess. And then you, when, when did Ted come about? I mean, when did the notion that you guys were going to write that movie come about? Mm, 
I want to say maybe 2009, 2008, 2009. I'm reading this Goldie comment here. There was a time at Cleveland, I ate pot brownies the night before and I was still fucked up and I pitched something and you didn't laugh and I snuck back to my office and cried. <laughs> I don't believe it. Um, you always got a story. Goldie's hilarious. Yeah. Um, Goldie, you got to do one of these. I'm going to call you soon. Uh, um, He's on the hook. Um, it would be a privilege to help you guys. And how did you become so awesome? Well, thank you for that. We, you know what? People always ask, and, and I'll get back to the TED thing in a second, but people always, I want to keep, keep some focus on, on the notion of this, this thing I'm doing. People always ask, how can I get on Family Guy? How can I be an animator on Family Guy? How can I be a writer on Family Guy? How can I do my voice on Family Guy? And all I can say is just make your stuff, you know, make your funny, write your funniest script and get it in the hands of, of an agent or anyone who will read it and just keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Same thing for any voices you do. Don't, don't just do voices, voice, make three dimensional cartoon characters, if that makes sense, you know, make real, you know, give, give the essence of someone and, and, verbalize that don't just do a funny oh hi there how are you you know like it's got to be there's got to be something to it like um i don't know but but i just say do your thing and like when i started i wanted to be on snl there was no family guy so all i knew to do was just keep doing what i was doing try to get snl folks to see things or try to meet whoever and that was getting close like i said but you just keep doing your thing and enjoy the process and get it to whoever you can. Agent assistants are very good because they want to find the, the, their clients that are going to be their bread and butter later on. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, uh, as you know, like just, <clears throat> especially if you want to get into comedy, obviously doing stand up, like there are a billion of them, but still do it because you meet so many people doing stand up. You know, you go to every open mic, there are 20 other comics there. And so if you watch them all, which you're sort of forced to, there are always going to be like two or three people where you're like, that guy's funny. I want to talk to that. You know, exactly. To that and then as we have now see, like those are the same people you end up working with down the road. And, and we all have helped each other you know, at, at different times. And, and so that's just kind of like a you know, if you're laughing with people now and you're trying to be in comedy and you're doing stand up, like you're, you're, you're doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think, and again, we'll, we'll get back to Ted, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of thinking on like what's, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy, very, I feel very, uh, you know, pretty satisfied with, with what my career has, has, been you know as the, the place I've gotten to blessed may be the word I don't know I'm just great very grateful and so I do spend some time right now particularly with the coronavirus thing and nobody can go anywhere I spend a lot of time thinking about the, what I what I want the world to be more like and I want people to keep doing their thing I want people I would love a world where everybody was following their passion and everyone else was being cool and helping everyone else find their thing you know that's like the ideal world you know so i think and what you're saying is talking about the comedy like you see that guy's funny that guy's funny you just if you put yourself out and you're doing what you like to do you will gravitate toward other people who are doing the same thing and you support each other like you were saying and you know a couple years down the line hey i gotta you know we need writers for this oh yeah that guy i remember that guy's hilarious let's see what he's got you know it, it just it just happens, you know, you just go. Right. And, um, you know, you just can't, you can't compromise your life, your goals. It, the shit can get hard, but you gotta just find a way and your head hits a pillow pretty nicely when you're doing everything you can do and you're not regretting the times going by. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard because I feel like I, t I totally agree with, the message and sometimes I feel personally like I feel like sort of a fraud saying it because I every, you know everybody has their struggles but I feel like things came fell into place easier for me than 
a lot of experiences that I've heard. Mm -hmm. so I don't mean to, you know, blithely say like, yeah, just make friends that stand up and everything will be fine. That's happened to be how it worked out for me. Yeah. But it, so it can happen that way, but it doesn't mean that it will. Right, right. Um, but you're doing your thing is the bottom line, no matter how easy or how hard it came, you're, you know, and I don't, I don't think it's all as easy as you're saying, but I, you know, that's cool. So, so Julius Sharp is Goldie and he said he's never slept better. My friend Peter Sag from college wants one of those brownies. Uh, Peter, I think you know where to get those brownies and um, who we got. Enjoy yeah, I, saw, laughs. I saw a kid from, they said he was in a Boston area high school who wanted to have information about how to get into animation. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think maybe, uh, I don't know, what do you send, send you or me a DM and hopefully we'll catch it on the, uh, on that accepted list. Sure. Yeah. Send, send a DM, but don't send a BM. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I just had there was a I love a BM joke and um yeah I, I don't know at some point I was talking about how I only would shit standing up facing the toilet and just put a lot of English on it uh it's like a gainer um it's, it's all it's conceptually I love a conceptual shit joke I'd never want to see a pile of shit um it, it, it's you know it's, on it. it's great I'm sorry, yeah. I'm a bit weird here. This is actual sunlight coming in. Hey, that's, you know what? You're on the West Coast, baby. So that's that's what you get. You know, we got we got moonlight now. Um, what else we got? Any experiences you can think of that would describe as a pivotal turning point in your career? I think, uh, you know, since I guess NL for you, Family Guy for me, where you where you get the gig, you know. Yeah. Or Family Guy for you, maybe. Yeah, I, mean, well, I mean, Family Guy was, boy, that was, that was big. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I had no, you know, none of us had any idea. But I knew it was really funny, and I knew Seth was really funny. And then, you know, it paid really well from yeah. coming from, you know, totally not employed at all to first level TV writers, a pretty nice jump. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good bump from zero to anything. So, uh, Alex Sulkin, uh, tell me about how TED came about. Well, it was Seth's idea. And he said, he asked Wellesley and I to help him write it. And you were in, Family Guy was obviously in production and was Seth still on, you know, at the, at the office a lot? Yes. Because I remember we had all the first meetings in his office. Mm -hmm. uh, that corner office there and yeah uh, yeah so I mean that was just the thing where the really the most difficult part of it was kind of laying out the outline in in great detail mm -hmm. um, and then we just went off separately and wrote scenes that we had been assigned the three of you yeah and came together and sort of smoothed it out Mm -hmm. uh, but that was that, that took a while because he was so involved at Family Guy at the time, like just, you know, very hands on and in the writer's room and overseeing everything. So he didn't have that much time. So we ended up working on weekends and it just took maybe, I don't know, a year and a half or something. to, to complete. Right. And then you took it out and um, you sold it to Universal and then was it pretty much straight to production at that point or pre-production or did it take a while or did they give you a lot of notes? How did that go? Boy, I don't remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I can't quite recall your honor exactly how that went down. I right. just remember writing a lot in his house and then yeah, it sold to universal. And then, then I think it was kind of like, you know, Seth handles all that shit. Cause he was, so much, you know, so much bigger of a player than yeah. and the rest of us. Yeah. So there were all kinds of phone calls and meetings and stuff that Wellesley and I weren't involved in, which was fine. We weren't like, why aren't we in those meetings? It was like, good, Seth, handle that. But when, right. do, when do we show up and make jokes? Right, right. So yeah, then we went to Boston and that filming uh, first Ted was awesome, so fun. So were you just freaking blown away at how huge that movie was? 
Oh, totally surprised. I mean, what? I mean, when? But you would watch test screenings and stuff, and you probably felt like it was hilarious, right? Well, sorry, my. Brother. All right, you're back. Yeah. So, did so you saw you saw rough cuts and test screenings, and you had to feel like it was funny, right? Well, we knew there were funny parts, but the, the rough cuts and test screenings were really tough because the bear was not animated. Ah. Uh. <laughs> so, like, honestly, that's so much of the charm of the movie, and I think why it worked is because the bear looked exactly the way it did, which was yeah. really cute and, you know, lovable, really. Yeah. Um, and we didn't have that. Like, for so many of them, it was just like a weird silver ball. That was no. Like, wow. Like, like, okay. <laughs> pack in 200 people in Sacramento and like see the silver ball floating around with Mark Wahlberg. That's tough. Um, so it was tough to judge. And when we saw the final cuts, we started thinking, well, maybe this, he looks really good. Like this, you know, this could be good. It will it be good. I don't know why anyone see it. And then that obviously the first weekend was so big and exciting that it was like, yeah. oh, thank God. That's yeah. I mean, it, it's it's so freaking funny, man. It, it, you know, that's that's a great movie. Hey, you're part of it. You have a star turn in that. Look what Jesus did. Oh, that's right. Look what Jesus did. Um, yeah, I was the Southern newscaster in a terrible wig and um, proud to be a part of it. Um, and so then that led to Ted 2 and A Million Ways to Die. And I, I just want to make sure that um, is there anything you want to share about those experiences? Because I want to leave a few minutes at the end for your latest Instagram sensation. Oh. Uh, sensational work that you're doing. Boy, this is all so unnecessary. I, would, I just like your positive <laughs> message. Um, the Ted, Ted Two and Million Ways. Well, Million Ways to Die in the West was an incredibly fun writing experience. It was like uh, I'm obsessed with the old West, as is Seth and Wellesley. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think we're we love Deadwood. You know, we're all into that kind of shit. Right. So I loved writing this and 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 making jokes about, you know, trying to update Mel Brooks, basically, which is right. blasphemy, but like trying to pick up his tradition of that kind. Sure. Um, ultimately, I don't think it turned out that way, but it was so fun to write. It was actually really fun being in New Mexico for that shoot. Like I loved getting to go to like a Western town every day to watch the shooting. It was a little yes. dusty and crazy, but I loved it. And then Ted too was just, also very fun to write and we had help on ted too from goldie who mm -hmm. he helped to write and and patrick megan and 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 i think viner like a few of those guys helped out in boston on that so that was fun because we had some nights where we got to like all go out to bars and shit to right whatever. and that was like the time when i still had the energy to do that stuff so yeah that was um, yeah, I mean, Million Ways to Die is a very funny movie. There is a lot of very funny stuff in that. Um, oh, there's so much funny stuff in it. And it, it was just like, I can't quite figure out. I feel like it's a little long in some spots, which yeah. is a very uh, tough thing for a comedy to be. Yeah. Like, the comedy starts to feel a little long. You, you get pulled out a little. Yeah, that's what she said. Um, so I, I agree. I agree. All right. So so Mario Cuomo um, has been doing a lot of uh, a lot of updates on on situations. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, Andrew Cuomo, thank you very I'm much. I'm sorry, I'm Andrew Cuomo. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So basically, I, on Instagram, I'm on Instagram. I'm having a lot of fun doing these uh, sort of COVID updates. Yes. Um, and because Andrew Cuomo is doing an amazing job, I think, from what I can tell. Yes. But his press conferences are, are very kind of humorous somehow because he's a character. Right. And I, I, so I thought like of impersonating him because the, the first time I heard him, the message from him seemed to be like, everything's going to be all right. Many people will die. You will die. But we're going to be <laughs> fine. And so I thought that was like a funny, weird contradiction. So yeah, I started doing it from there. And my impressions are not good at all they're like oh know. it's great well you have but you know it's the essence it's it you you got it the essence it's yeah more a, a carvey-esque impression than a daryl hammond-esque impression sure yeah that's good that's so, good but yeah i've been having fun doing that and then i 
I got into the mayor, Boston mayor, Matty Walsh, because he, right. does, he does actually have a thick accent. I'm, I'm again, exaggerating. Yeah. But he has a real chowderhead accent. So I, I find it fun to give uh, updates about, you know, words that have, a, a, you know, AR in them, uh, Marblehead and Attleboro and, you know, yeah. House Court. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, it's great stuff. I mean, it's funny. And it's, it's like, uh, it's something to look forward to every day. It's, it's, you know what I would say, this is almost like a modern day uh, comic strip. You know, you, instead of reading the paper on the crapper and looking through the funnies, you got your phone and you're, oh, what is he doing today? And, and uh, when comic strips became quite popular it was the Great Depression when everybody was very- Is that true? Yeah, pre yeah, preoccupied about sad shit that was going on around them. They could take solace in these little moments of, you know, right. some guy beating his wife at home or whatever the hell. Right, was. between splashes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah yeah um hey anybody got any questions you know we, this thing will cut us off straight up at um at uh, the top of the hour so just it'll give us a little countdown but um do you see any questions on here you want to hit or anybody that you know that um... uh, oh somebody asked about ted three uh no oh definitely avoided dads says Colby. oh <laughs> shit hilarious yeah, uh, never mind. We can avoid that. Ted three question mark. Well, well, I'm, you know what, Dad. I mean, you, they're not all home runs. You know, I mean, it's and it's it's sometimes. very hard to go into a system and make make art. And well, they're not all home runs. And in fact, sometimes you get Tony Seed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, um, Dad. Goldie's got a lot of nerve bringing up Dad, seeing as he wrote more episodes of Dad's than anyone alive on Earth. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, good job, Goldie. Yeah, no, it was uh, really fun. That was a great writer's room, too. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, Goldie, Gold, uh, Julia Sharp is Goldie, and Goldie's got a funny book out. Um, so, you, so you're going bald, which I got for Christmas. So funny, Hilar relentlessly funny. I like to describe. It. Yes, and and painful for some of us. But um, oh, that's right. I'm so sorry. That's okay. You know what? I'm fine with this. Whoa. I got, I got, uh, I got a wife I'm happy with, and you know what else am I going to do? She's awesome. Um, and you got a wife. You got a wonderful wife, Alec. And Love you know. It's funny how this shit all works out, you know. You no, find no, you have your you got your bong, you got your comedy, and then it all leads to like a career and a great wife, you know, and kids and you know all that. Wow, I'm way behind on these questions. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're winding down here. It, uh, I appreciate you doing this, and I love doing it. it's great yeah. Talking. I feel like, you know, I, I haven't really seen you since this thing started. I'm going to turn this thing into a little bit more, I think. Um, I'm going to do it again next week, and then I'm going to see how I can up it a little bit um, and reach a little bit broader audience. I'm working on working on some things for that. So I'd love to have you back and, um, you know, talk more, and we'll, we'll catch up. And yeah, I will be, I'll be there. Sweet. And, and, yeah, we had a great time at that World Series game two years ago when the uh, Dodgers were playing the Red Sox and you and I went out, um, went out to Dodger stadium and uh, we were there for the 18. It was at 18 innings. It, it was two baseball games and it, it finally. And there were, and as you know, I sent you the picture. There was yes. a picture of us in the Boston Globe and many papers the next day, both looking very bored. I was yawning maybe and you're are you yawning when I was. Yes, I'm trying to find it. Hold on. I don't know if I can load this up. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Uh, oh, wait. I'm cut out of that because you're over. Oh, wait. Your, your oh, you can't see it? Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Oh, it no. is that picture. Yeah, maybe it's everyone. It's covering me up. So, yes. um, and it, yeah, my wife asked me after that picture, was like, who are you sitting with? Because it looks like I'm sitting with the woman. I'm like, no, I'm with that guy. No, no. Yeah, you, you were sitting with a hippopotamus who was yawning next to you. Uh, yeah. Um, but that that was a blast, and we've we've had a ton of great times, and and yeah. hopefully many more, maybe even in person one day soon. Absolutely, you know? that'd be fun. 
Well, uh, well, we're going to get cut off. And I, thanks, everyone, for, for watching and for your questions. And um, if I promised you a T-shirt, it's going to be going out this weekend. And um, I'll be doing some more T-shirt giveaways, some kicked in the nut shirts and a few Family Guy shirts that I have. Um, and, uh, and that's it, man. Stay, stay healthy and happy. And, you know, much love to you, brother. You too, buddy. Thanks for having me. Love you. Love your family.